I'm going to talk a little bit about the doing, working on the book and the experience of reading the book, and then I'm going to go through some slides, and then you can ask me any questions you want, and I might have some of the answers. We'll see. So, uh, ever since I was very young, I loved to read. Uh, loved to be transported by an author's word to a different time, a different place, to meet and understand different people and cultures. Of course, some of the writers that had a seismic impact on me at 10 years of age, at 14, or even at 18, have faded over time. Uh, as I've developed into the person I am today, I can look back at that younger boy and recognize that my tastes have changed. <laughs> or I've grown, that experience I had then reading a particular book is not the same one I have now. Uh, it's interesting to consider the books that for each of us personally, uh, ones that have faded over time and those that haven't. Uh, in middle school, while my teachers were busy assigning me Silas Marner and the Red Badge of Courage, I discovered on my own <laughs> the pure joy of reading with a seemingly endless, <laughs> endless stream of Edgar Rice Burroughs novels. Uh, featuring Tarzan or John Carter of Mars. Sadly, today, <laughs> it's difficult for me to read those books. <laughs> but I love that I did, and I wouldn't read today without them. Uh, and yet, it was only a few short years after in high school that I discovered Ray Bradbury's haunting poetic tales. Uh, his books, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and Dandelion Wine, and a host of others, will ha still have a place of pride in my home library. As did J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, whose epic adventure claimed my heart and soul at 14, and still do. Um, these books continue to re reveal fresh, surprising aspects every time I reread them. Another such treasure is The Wizard of Ursi. Uh, I first read Ursula K. Le Guin's novel in 1970 when I was taking a children's literature course at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, the book had only been published a few years before that, but it already got, garnered a number of well-deserved awards, uh, as did all five books that followed in the Earthsea series. Over the years, I revisited each book multiple times and every read-through has left me even more impressed with Miss Le Guin's writing skills. So much so, <laughs> that years later when I was attending a convention where she was the guest of honor, I did what many of them, every one of you have done, <laughs> is uh, I let my awe of her overcome me and my shyness come in, and I didn't go up and talk to her, and I didn't say how much I enjoyed her work. And I would break myself for years after that because of doing that. So imagine my delight when four years ago, Joe Monty, the executive editor of Saga Press, a division of Simon & Schuster, called to let me know that for the first time ever, all six Earthsea novels were being collected under one cover. And the biggest surprise, for me at least, was that he was asking me to illustrate them all. And, uh, there was just one catch. <laughs> Miss Le Guin was now in her late 80s and had always been disappointed with the art that had been attached to her books. So for this definitive project, she wanted to talk to whichever artist Saga selected, not only talk with them, she informed Mr. Bondi, but she would only work with someone that she respected the work of and that she personally liked. <laughs> <laughs> So, one Friday afternoon in October, four years ago, via email, we set up a time for our phone call, and then I sweated through a very, very long weekend, thinking about what I would say. Then, because she lives on the West Coast, I placed the call early on a Monday afternoon and hoped for the best. I needn't have worried. She insisted I call her Ursula, and we talked for perhaps an hour and a half. She proved to be equal parts witty, insightful, generous, but certainly had no desire whatsoever to suffer stupidity in anyone. She can be very cranky. <laughs> 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 
delightfully so most of the time. We both agreed on the pleasures of collaborating with other artists and how, in the right circumstances, it could pull the best work out of both. We discussed at length her disappointments with most of the previous cover art that had been on her book jackets, and she let me know as well her extreme dislike of both film adaptations that had been produced over the years. You see, when Ursula first conceived of the world where she would set these books, her immediate impulse was to push, push back at the then almost universal use of European protagonists for every fantasy epic that had been published into the mid-1960s. Every single one of those heroic souls had been white and some were even blue-eyed, uh, which is fine, but she was disappointed that an entire world full of diverse cultures had been given far too little representation. So Earth C, as the name suggests, was constructed from a multitude of scattered islands, peopled by diverse races, most of which were people of color and many shades and hues. Ged, her would-be wizard and main protagonist of a number of the books in this series, is very clearly described as having deep reddish-brown skin. Uh, her father is a very famous anthropologist who worked a lot with the Pacific Northwest Native Americans. She spent a lot of time with them, and she sent a picture that I really, really tried to find of a group of these Native Americans around her father, and she told me that the one to his right was Ged. This house, that's what she thought of him as. And it, it's really a fun, really nice picture to look at, but it eluded my skills of finding. Of course, she fought back as best she could, but was told by marketing department of every publisher that, de that was publishing the books that depicting such a person on the cover of books would kill the sales of that book. Even after Ursula won award after award, she had little influence on that attitude. The first book of Ursi, The first book, A Wizard of Earthsea, is a terrific, splendidly told adventure. It's true that its characters have odd, sometimes difficult to pronounce names, <laughs> uh, but Ged, which is absolutely not pronounced Jed, he has no TV hillbilly about him at all, <laughs> Ged's quest to find his true self and thus to acknowledge and to accept the darkness that is a part of all of us is heady stuff for a book that was marketed to young people. But there are also perilous sea voyages aplenty, evil enchantresses, and I'm happy to say there are dragons as well. Miss um, Le Guin wrote five more earth sea books over the course of 33 years, and as she aged, so too did her protagonist, their concerns deepening as well, in ways that are always surprising and ultimately satisfying for the reader. In 2018, it will be 50 years since the publication of that first book that we're all celebrating here today. And Ursula will finally have her way with my illustrations, not only on A Wizard of Earth Sea, but with the entire series. Because er because ever since that phone call, I've been in very close collaboration with her, our emails flying back and forth on a regular basis. I've done my best to slip inside her mind my very best, and uh, so that I can depict Ursi in, in the manner and detail in which she's always envisioned it. And I hope you'll enjoy my efforts when you get to see them all. So, um, so uh, I've been working on this for about four years, which boggles my mind, but it also allows me to look at drawings that I've done like two years ago and have worked on many other ones since then and adapt what I've learned about those characters and what they're wearing and all those things. This is the first very, very rough sketch. I did these on uh, copy paper, uh, so there's no intimidation of this beautiful piece of paper in front of you and you better do something good on it. Uh, and I use the side of my pencil and I just sketch away at it. Uh, and this is uh, uh, more of a finished drawing from there. Uh, more the the first one is for myself. This is for uh, the editor or the publisher to look at. They can tell more of what's going in there. But 
again, a, you know, the book is really a compan two companions. It's uh, Ged and Tanar, this woman that uh, appears in the second book, and their relationship. Uh, so I realized that she needed to be there. <laughs> so I popped her in. Uh, so I was doing these drawings, and I finished these and went off and started doing all the other ones. Uh, and in that time, I, this is the finished pen and ink that I will be put color on top of. But I knew from lots of conversations with Ursula that the clothes were different uh, than what I'd drawn. They don't have typical uh, Gandalf flowing robes. Uh, they're much more of a medieval uh, workaday life. Uh, she really was insistent that the world could have dragons and people tending gardens in it, and you should know that. And the people in it were not all resplendent kings and queens, but people that were tilling the earth. And this is the first color washes that I work with. I layer them up, and <laughs> if this machine worked right, you would now see the color piece that had been up there earlier, but it is not. <laughs> so, uh, and these are apparently are going to be all out of order. So here we go. Uh, after carefully numbering every single one of them. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, the books uh, will have color pieces and about 60 black and whites. Uh, this is an individual title page for the fourth, fifth book. Uh, let's see what happens. Well, that's interesting. This is the finished piece. Ignore <laughs> this other day. Yay! Uh, the finished color. So, the book with six books in it is the spine. It's about this big. This is that's the spine. Wow. Blown up big. So, yes, I had to think of imagery that could be on it. Uh, and leave space for titles and authors and me and various quotes that I'm sure they'll put on it. Where will we go? And this is the uh, overall title page for the entire collection and it's both Ursula and I were very happy this went to maybe a dozen revisions back and forth with her and it actually has everything that happens in all six books on one drawing. <laughs> Only you won't know that until you finish the books and you go back and look at it. But one of the things, as she wrote, since she wrote it over such a long time period, she, her idea of her world uh, evolved, changed, um, and she came to believe that the dragons in it and the humans in it all came from the same person. And that at a certain time, the dragons decided they wanted to fly and to be free, and the humans wanted to hoard things, so and keep things. So that this is them saying goodbye, and then there are various characters all through there. One of the other interlying uh, bits of the book is that, and it starts off early in, I think even in the first one, that the dead worlds, the people where everyone goes that's dead, are dry, dusty, and nobody knows each other. And in, in the way, when you read the first book, you don't quite think about it, but then after a while you're like, well, that's pretty unfair. <laughs> and she works it out by the end. Uh, again, this is an individual title page for the first book, our celebratory book. And these are some of the drawings. Now, this, this is uh, sort of the collaboration that I would have if you can see it, uh, they're sort of in the center is a, a horse and a cart, and that's a horse. And up above there the, is the school of wizardry that young Ged who's, is going to, and has to find his way to. And she was really, she insisted that the school would not be that evident to begin with. It's supposed to be a, a rambling building, but not tall. And, and noticeable, and she said, there weren't very many horses on our seat, Charles. It would be oxen, you have to do oxen. So when I finished it up, it's oxen in there, and the school's down further, and 
Uh, and this is something I like to play with in art, is that at the bottom of this piece you're looking down, and at the top of the piece you're looking up, which is not realistic, but it is a piece of art, so why do you have to be realistic? So, And it was just really fun to draw. It took a very long time, <laughs> but it will go quickly. This will be painted, uh, and it was really fun, and I feel like I could live there, although it might be stinky. <laughs> Too many gutters in the street, you know. Uh, this is young Ged when he was still known as Dory. Dooney. 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 And he's uh, wandered in, he's been invited in by his aunt, who's sort of a hedge witch. And he decides he wants to learn how to do some magic. And uh, in, in her world, people. Uh, start off with one name, and then at, I suppose at puberty, they're given their real name, which they never tell anyone. It's a, it's a concept that the people that know your real name have power over you. And I always <laughs> think of when my mom would call me Charles Dana. I knew I was in trouble and she had power over me. <laughs> so, but this is Dooney. And he apprentices with the witch and learns a few things. Thinks he knows much more than he does. Uh, this is Ged, very young. He's uh, 16 or 17. He's come to the wizarding school and he's speaking to the headmaster in the courtyard in the center of the school. I finished, this is a finished piece and it's done. Uh, can we, can you turn these off? We can see lots better. Yeah, you don't need to see me. <laughs> You've seen me. Uh, they're done with a colored Prismacolor pencil on <laughs> uh, a white drawing paper that I bought at Office Max. So um, I, I post a lot of things on Facebook and talk to other artists, and they always want the the magic pencil and the magic piece of paper that's going to make your drawings really well, good looking. And I'm always like, it doesn't matter what you use, it's what you put in it, what you put on it. Is the bird a student or a teacher? It's his companion. It's a very large raven. Very large. <laughs> but. Uh, and this is a rough sketch that will be finished up at some point, very soon now. Uh, later on, he goes, uh, get his, he's, thought he knows more than he does and he's released uh, his shadow self uh, into the world and it's a very dangerous thing and he has to go off and find some way to take care of that shadow. And this is him coming to the where the dragon has lived for thousands of years and having this con conversation. They're very, very intelligent but very, very uh, dangerous too. This is a city, a little sketchy stuff down there at the bottom is an ancient city that's fallen into ruin after the giant has come and taken it over. And this uh, is later on in the book and Ged has confronted various evildoers and his shadow and just run and run and turns and you, as a wizard there you can turn into a other creatures, but if you stay in that body too long, you forget that you're human. And he's been for a long time racing away from the shadow as a sparrow hawk. And I have to do research on the sparrow hawk because it sure isn't yet that. And his teacher there, he comes back to his teacher. Uh, and this is, I was good. one of the things I wanted to um, look up was, do I have the second one of this? Nope. Uh, I did this drawing, this is, again, it's on copy paper and it wasn't big enough so I taped some more onto it and kept drawing. And uh, I sent, I scan them, then I send them to Ursula. Uh, in this, in the book, it's near the end of the book and he and his companion have been uh, sailing across the oceans trying, uh, trying to catch the shadow beast and he, they finally get so far away from the world 
<clears throat> that there's a sort of sand dune kind of thing floating in the ocean and he confronts the shadow creature there and I drew it like this uh, she says it's a thing of shadows changing in shape and form and um, various things and I sent this to her and she said well Charles I have to tell you something um, when I was writing this in the 60s my form of relaxation was to look at things under a microscope, look at things on slides under a microscope. And this would have been a very primitive microscope and just those glass slides that we had in biology class that we would look at things in. And she would just put something on it, slap it on it, put it under the microscope and look at it. And she was look one day she was looking at <laughs> this thing and it was a really, she saw a really strange dark uh, amorphous shape moving and it frightened her and she tried to write that shape and it, then she sent me a picture of what they are they're creatures I keep seeing them pop up and it starts with a T and it's very long and I don't remember what it is but it's a little microscopic creature that now with microscopic photographer you can see them perfectly shaped and they're weird looking but not scary but I could imagine seeing this strange thing moving around so I had to redraw it but we don't have the redraw here. Uh, this, and I'm going to show you some other pieces from the other books. Because if you read that one, you've got to read the rest of them. <laughs> this is the Tombs of Atuan, which when I was 22 years old reading it, it, the first book it had a lot of adventure to it and was really exciting, plus thinking involved in it. This book, Seemed to be, it was from the viewpoint of this young girl. She's standing between the two priestesses. She's being stripped of everything, including her name, and is going to be the, pre, the lead priestess of this uh, cult uh, of these dark gods. And he, uh, Ged comes to that island, and there's a labyrinth underneath these uh, temples. And she catches him in the labyrinth, and they have this long conversation, and finally, uh, Things happen, I won't tell you what happens. Uh, this will be in color when I'm done. And this is the individual title page. Little Arha, the nameless one. Uh, and this is her down there on the right. Uh, her teacher and herself, she's being shown the labyrinth underneath the uh, temple for the very first time. There's a giant rock wall that's been built over top of the sort of lava flows. And the labyrinth goes on for a very, very long ways. I was about three quarters of the way through working in this book when Ursula went, well, have you seen the maps? Went, what maps? And she'd drawn the entire labyrinth and very elaborately, for, which would have helped a whole lot a little earlier on. But. <laughs> Uh, this is again Arha, she's dancing uh, with all, uh, in the, the theory of this uh, religion is that she is the reincarnation of this original priestess and there have been thousands of them over the years and this was her dancing in front of the altar imagining that all of them uh, were dancing around her. Uh, in the labyrinth, in the painted chamber. Um, and I, this went through oh, six or seven redraws uh, till I finally felt like I got it. And there's supposed to be painted figures on the rock walls and Ged has been chained in there and left for days and days and days without any food. And Arha is coming back because her curiosity has gotten better. And there they are having a conversation and uh, the reason why Ged has come is that there's a the ring of Arabetha, uh, which is supposed to bring uh, uh, the rule of law back to the world and one half he has one half of it and she had one half of it so they're joining it right there and one of the things I try to do with most of these pieces and I've gone even darker with this um, 
is not show the characters' faces because millions and millions of people have been reading this for a lot of years and they already know what those characters look like inside their head and I'm not going to try to tell them any different. So I've been trying to draw the, the environments and, and what their life is like. And this is at the end of the book, the sort of semi-happy ending with uh, Ged and Arha in his boat, the Look Far, sailing away from the island. And one of the reasons why I finished what I finished in color, the Prismacolor colored pencils is that I kept wondering all the way through drawing these things. One was, I love the atmosphere of the pencil sketches and how was I going to do that in pen and ink. And also that if all the figures are different shades of people of color, how am I going to do that in pen and ink? And it's, it works way better with the, the uh, colored pencil. Arha and her culture are all white. It's one of the few cultures in all the islands that are like that. Uh, this is the frontispiece piece for the third book. Uh, Ged is much older. He's, he's in, closing in on his 50. And he's with his companion Aaron down there. and they're Having a conversation with the dragon. And I tried to imagine being there, being on that prow of that boat, and then how you, the, the uh, sail of the ship with the wings being flapping back and forth, what that would be like, and thought of Hokusai waves and lots of other things. It's going to be really fun to paint. The light is going to be coming through the wings, so the darkness of the body will sort of be a silhouette against the faded out wings. The farthest shore. This is the third book. Uh, this is the first illustration. And this is the finished one. Uh, again, colored pencil on cheap paper. <laughs> uh, second page. They, in this illustration, uh, Ged and Aaron are going. The magic is leeching away from the world, and things that used to work aren't working any longer. And they and Ged is wondering why. So. One misty morning, he and Aaron go off looking. And they get to this island that used to have the most beautiful fabrics in the world. We're traded all over the islands, and the silkworms are dead and dying, and the people are sort of crazy, and they have to go through a lot of, uh, a lot of looking for what they have to find. Uh, and one of the things they find is out in the ocean of civilization that lives on giant, giant rafts. Uh, and every year at midsummer they have a celebration. Uh, the older people are pounding on the wood, making a sort of rhythmic beat, and all the young people uh, leap from raft to raft and do this big circle. Uh, and this is uh, Aaron. Uh, for the longest time I had Ged drawn down here in the bottom right, and I drew him in various versions and various ways, and he always looked awkward. And finally, one day, I realized I could just erase him. Uh, he <laughs> because uh, the light from his staff is showing there, and it's, it's enough of him to be there. So I did a lot of erasing of things while I was working. Uh, Aaron and Ged have been thrown up on this shore of the sea, and uh, the dragon Calliasson comes to uh, save them. They, you know, even when the uh, dragons are part of the good guys, they still should be ferocious. So. And I'll just show a couple of them. This is a frontispiece for the fourth book, uh, Tianu, which is about the uh, young woman, uh, Arha, who had been brought to the island to, grow, to live and uh, be a, an apprentice for... Uh, the wizard that was there, but she, instead she went off and married a farmer and and had several children and lived an entire life uh, away from magic, uh, which is what was happening with Ursula. She got to the end of the third book, knew sort of knew she wanted to do more, but couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, and it took she raised two children, and it was fourteen, thirteen or fourteen years after the third book that the fourth one came out. Uh, and it's more conversations. 
it has dragons, of course, and it has some adventure and whatever, but it's more conversations with uh, Tanar, the young woman, the older woman now, and various people. And one of the conversations that it has is, why do men not listen to women? <laughs> it's, and it, it is something that huh? they, don't. they don't. The older you get, the more interesting it gets as you read it. Uh, Tejano, who's the title character of the book, is a young girl that's been uh, really subjected to a lot of horrific things, including her parents rolling her into a fire and leaving her there, which burns the sides of her face and her hand off. But she has many uh, strengths. And I'll just go through these. Here's one of those scenes of, you know, it's uh, getting the goat out of the garden. <laughs> Ursula loved this. <laughs> uh, this is a, another witch character, Auntie Moss, speaking with Tanar. And this is part of the, they're having their conversation about men and women. Uh, over there on the right, Tanar and Tihano are walking through the, the dragon gate into a city. I won't tell you what this is because that would reveal the, the plot. Huh. <laughs> well, there, you've got a whole process. This is uh, from the fourth book, and it's just my original sketch, and then a little bit more, and then I talked to Ursula, and the, she, the woman there standing there is turning into the dragon. She wanted it to be more part of the dragon, so her head is going into it and disappearing into it in the finished piece. I don't know what will be here. This is the frontispiece for the fifth book, which is a number of short stories on the history of Ursi. Uh, this is the frontispiece for the fifth book. These will be in color, and we're going to go backwards here. Okay. Well, yeah, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so if you've got any questions, I don't know, I've not asked, I don't want to know. I'm just working as hard as I can to get it done. I don't, if I find out a, a deadline, I'll start freaking out, because it's probably next week. <laughs> yes? Who controls the dragon? They are control themselves. They are a civilization to themselves, uh, very ancient and mysterious to most of the people on the, on the islands. And they've, they've had an agreement like, thousands and thousands of years ago that the dragons will live in the west and the people will live in the east. And, thing, and they've continued for the most part. But things, again, this disruption of uh, magic and madness is happening and they come back to the east and are disrupting things. They live forever? They live they, a long time. They don't live forever, but they're you know, thousands of years old. The, um, so the dragons have English spoken no. dialogue? No, they, uh, they speak uh, uh, the, the language of the first people. The, the language of making is what she calls it. When you when you say those words, then you've made them real. So it's very, uh, it, they're diabolical and clever and shifty. <laughs> so, with so that. can the human characters... Only some of them. Ged can't. Them. If you've studied that language, then you, if you worked hard. If you've been to school and you worked really, really hard. <laughs> when you read the first book, did you, is this what you were visualizing? In 1972? No, I don't believe so. <laughs> uh, I might have visualized it, but I couldn't have drawn it. Um, you know, there, I saw a lot of this stuff, but I just didn't have the ability to draw it yet. So. Anyway. Are the dragons antagonistic to people? Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes they're companions. Sometimes they're... It gets at a certain point, people start appearing in the books that... Uh, it can be human and dragon at the same time. So, 
come and go. And I don't think they talk about Michelangelo either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. You have obviously created a good working relationship with Ursula. Yeah. Which can be very tricky. Yes. If you've done this. Was there any piece, any character or scene where you felt, no, I really want it to be this way, and she really wanted it to be that way? No, I, so far, I mean, everything she's ever said, I've been like, all right, okay. Uh, there's been a couple things, of, and I won't remember exactly, but they're really minor that I went, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> you know. But usually, if she's, because she's not asking for a particular scene, and she's not asking for how it's going to be drawn, it's just, it's usually the concept or philosophy of the drawing. And, and sometimes it's a... I've drawn a character and she said, well, you know, she's a little weak there. She's thinking of this and that, and she wouldn't be that way. Mm. So, and it, it's really wonderful. It's been a great, great pleasure doing it all. Um, you know, for many years as a college teacher, I taught her adult yes. fiction. Yeah. And, you know, she called it prophetic fiction right. rather than science fiction because it was meant to come out of the real world. Mm -hmm. and um, more fully than most science fiction writers. And I remember the story of the, one who, the ones who walked away, away from, from Amelus. Am yes. Am Am yes. And that was, with my college students, always a major story. Like, she ends it. Where yeah. are they going to go yeah. when the world is no longer livable? And it sounds like she's working some of those ideas yes. into this. Yes. Sure. It is, like I said, it start the first book is definitely directed toward teenage or middle grade. She was asked to write a book for younger kids, but there's themes in it that they might be able to grasp or they might not. And as the books go along, there's more and more of that, and where to where some people don't like the lighter books because they want the adventure of the first books and. I just think they're wonderful. Get more wonderful as they go. <laughs> so. so in four years of working on this book, it sounds like you've not met in person? No. And are there plans for you to meet well, at some point? Well, she's 89 years old. She's not going anywhere other than Portland, Oregon. She, she drove up an hour, two hours away for some convention a couple of years ago, and uh, I can't, I don't have the energy to do that anymore. So. I am trying to <laughs> trying to wait till I'm done and take all the pictures out there and go see her and show them to her. But you know, it's also a little like she's 89. <laughs> you gotta get quicker. Um, so, but uh, she seems to be in good health and she's got a, her brain is great. You know, so I don't know what her body is like, feeling like. But uh, we've had some really interesting conversations. She was also one of the people that was instrumental in getting. The bird sanctuary, animal sanctuary, established in Oregon that the Bundys took over. Boy, was she pissed off! <laughs> Whoa! So, because uh, nobody could go there for you, you know, however long they were there. So, yes. What world myths, religion, culture difference? Well, I think it's more the the uh, uh, there's. Zen, there's uh, Taoist, there's all, she's done a lot of reading, a lot of, you know, thinking about all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, certainly the Native Americans, because uh, she grew up with, around all that. And it's, it's always there in her fiction. Uh, some of it's more overt than others. It's always, she's, thinks deeper about stuff than most people do. And she can seem to make it happen on the page and not be boring. So that's a plus. <laughs> yes, Carol? Speaking as an artist, I need to interrupt the mood, but did you get advances? On yes, that? yes. Or are you starving today? No, no, no. I, it's, this is paying very well, and they've, yeah. So they're still, you know, yeah, if I get the drawing stone, I'll get some more. <laughs> <laughs> How did you how did you select the scenes to illustrate? Did you work with her on that? No, no. That was all me. It was pacing through the book. I 
tried really hard. There's only once or twice where there are pictures that are very close to each other. I tried to space them out and find something interesting to do, to draw. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I have my copies of the book and they have, they're underlined, they're circled, they're yellow tagged. There's all sorts of cool scene, you know, or great drawing, good vignette. So, and then I was going back and choosing and I did five major drawings for each book and two of those five are double page spreads. So there's, it should feel full. I mean, I could keep going for, give me another 10 years, I could keep on going. So. Are, the, are the major drawings in color or the black and white? Black and white, there's, each book has a color piece. Most everything's in black and white. Has the Lynn or the publisher raised the possibility of you doing other books? Of the well, the, we realized, or I realized, and then she re was actually realizing it at the same time, was that our conversation, email conversation, and which was recalling all sorts of memories that she hadn't thought of in 40 years about this book, uh, that it would make a really fascinating book with the, uh, the sketches, the original sketches and the conversation back and forth. Now, there are things that we've done that will never be in the book, but we uh, built the uh, little house that her, her wizard, original wizard lived in. And we figured out, you know, she, she would do a little sketch and then I would do a sketch and we, because we just wanted to know. So we figured that out. So it was kind of fun. Yeah. How good artist is she? Uh, she sent me a really nice book. <laughs> <laughs> she does, she's part of a portrait group that, and she publishes uh, uh, chat books and she'll do the illustration on the cover. And they're, they're nice, they're okay, they're, they work. But she did, sent me a book, she said, because this is a landscape she would go to every summer for 30 or 40 years, and it was basically the landscape that's in the tombs of Atuan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a really nice private, uh, I guess regional book, and it's uh, full of big color photographs, her poetry, and then her pen and ink drawings. Mm -hmm. And the pen and ink drawings are, you know exactly what she means, is not always drawn really nicely, but it, you know what it means, and that's, it's good. Yes. So. Maybe you're on a book tour, so you could have she's not able to? If there is one, I will be doing it. I'm doing this, I'm going to Farmville for the first Virginia Children's Book, Children's Literature Festival, uh, in about two weeks, and I'm doing an event in Ohio, about an hour up from Columbus at a museum that's part of a big reads kind of thing. And, and I'm sure there'll be others. Because it's, I'm, yeah, I'm the one that can move. I can still move, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so this edition is all five books in one book? Yeah, one big fat book. If you've ever held the, the Alan Lee illustrated Lord of the Rings, it's going to be the same size. It's, the spines are almost five inches. It's heavy. It'll be heavy. And how big? Uh, no, kind of normal sized. I wish they'd do a giant. Wishes were fishes. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, we've talked about other writers, not science fiction writers, usually. We did talk about George Martin a little bit, but because I illustrated one of his books. And so we talked about it. <laughs> she does, but uh, there's, she's picky about it. But we've talked about other, other. there's a Scottish author, Neil Gunn, that I was a big fan of, that I, and she spent a lot of time in Scotland, and I talked to her about him, and, and she got one of his books and loved it, and so we had that conversation, that was really fun. Well, it is real fake. Science Yes. Will you own this art? So yes. That you, you can use it for cards, cards, and calendars. And <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to go back and reread that contract. It's been a long time now. <laughs> I can't remember, but usually you can. You just can't package it all together. Right. So. Now, how did you get the concept for the drag, the look of the drag? Oh, see, I meant to have that. I have a whole slideshow of that. It was a, a 
Okay, we all decided we were going to do this book. And then Joe Monte had to corral three separate publishers into writing one contract about to let, the, to let him do this book because they already had the rights. Uh, that took a year and a half to do that. And in that year and a half, Ursula and I achieved Dragon. And was, I started with a couple drawings of typical dragons and we'd send them to her and she would talk about it and we'd back and forth and back and forth. And about a year and a half later, and it wasn't all the time, of course, because I was doing other jobs and she was doing other things. But finally, uh, it, it was a funny conversation. And I, one of the things I hoped to do <laughs> here was to have those drawings and to, but then I would have had to reread all those emails and I just didn't have the time. They've got, they've got Human, kind of human-like Sort of. They're not supposed to be able to build instruments. She kept going, you, you keep making them finger-like, and they're not fingers, they're more talons. They have big, long talons. Uh, they, <laughs> although when she first starts describing them, they're slanted-eyed and ferocious and blah, 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 all this stuff, and she's like, well, they don't have slanted eyes, Charles. I'm like, well, <laughs> you kind of describe them that way. <laughs> but they're supposed to have more human-like eyes and... Uh, like a horse, yeah. yeah, like a horse. So, but there were things like I would, I had, had finally started getting the dragon drawn pretty interestingly, and she was like, "There's still, there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. Some, it's something's off." And finally, I figured out that the sort of, they're not really hair, but these sort of horns, multitude of horns are coming out. I had them going up, and once I put them coming down, she liked that a lot. So one was male and one was female for her. So, so how many years have you been? I don't know, four years. I'm just guessing. I'm imagining that for an author to have a four-year conversation about her own work that she did 50 years ago mm -hmm. must be really fascinating it, uh, it, to yes. think about her own rethinking mm -hmm. of her work. Well, like I said, there's all sorts of ideas of things that she thought of and hadn't thought of since she'd written. She went, well, you know, Charles, <laughs> she'll go off. And that was one of the reasons we tried to not make this book that might happen about the conversation back and forth official. We both agreed. We said, if we make it official, then we'll be thinking about that when we're writing emails. And it really wanted to have them offhand, and, and we'll have to cut out some comments. <laughs> Green fire. Yes. They are tough. They're big, and they uh, when they walk across uh, marbled stone, then they leave huge gouges, and and they're steaming gouges. So because they're they're very hot creatures. So there's a lot of things that it, it's a matter of thinking about the creature and what you've invented and what it would react to to being on certain things. A lot of times people have those big giant dragons that leap up onto a house and then leap away and nothing happens to the house. You know, like, eh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's gone. <laughs> I have to ask the question, did you get any ideas from Game of Thrones on television? Well, I illustrated one of those books and I haven't watched a whole lot of Game of Thrones. No, the dragons don't have anything to do. It's a totally different idea of dragons. And stuff. Which, which George R. R. book did you illustrate? A Storm of Swords. It's a limited edition signed by George and I. I did 60 black and whites and about eight color pieces. They broke it into two different books because it was so damn big. You know? So, and it, you. It's part of a series of books. They've done all those books limited edition. There are only 400 copies of each one. They go for a pretty penny. So. Um, you mentioned there were three publishers that you had to work out. Is that because no, you're gonna have you to, had, I, I don't know. You had diff, I mean, just they had already, they, the had book, different rights to the books. Is that why? The, she had sold the rights to the books to be published, and they had been in print for 35 years. And I can't remember, there's Athenium, there might be Harper's, there might be McMillian, I don't know. Uh, and, you know, they still have rights to publish the book. So this was sort of a, 
okay, we're going to let you be able to do this and you have to pay us some, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't want to know. <laughs> That's, so the, the publishers had rights to all the different books, different publishers? Or no, some, some had one book, some, some had another yes. book. Because, again, because it had taken so long to do them that probably one publisher did the first three and then various other people did the other ones. So. And it's also, this collection is also gathering some essays and some novellas that she's written that were never in any of the books. Uh, and one in particular that was only ever published online that will be in here. And then I think two short stories that were pre RC, but obviously that was where it came from. So all that will be in there. What's the market you're targeting? I'm not targeting any market. <laughs> I'm just drawing the pictures. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> not my job. <laughs> so. Okay. I got one more real quick. Um, uh, what, one of her priorities in the in your artwork was showing the diversity of the characters. Mm -hmm. Has that impacted your your artwork in any way from working? Well, I've thought artwork? about it a lot more, and there's things I've reworked some older paintings and like uh, your your Four Seasons. Yes, yeah, yeah, like the Four Seasons, and uh, it just just made me more aware of it. <coughs> like, why am I always drawing white people? I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. I can't imagine working with somebody that has a mind like her mind. What is she considered? You consider her probably the most interesting person that you ever worked with? Well, no, because I've worked with Neil Gaiman, who's interesting, Charles DeLynn, various people. But she's really uh, authoritative and very, just, she can write beautifully and uh, she's a very deep thinker, and you just have to try really hard to keep up with her. Yes, yes. It's really the thing that you realize uh, as you go on in your career is that uh, working with the best writing you can makes your art get better because you have to try and keep up with that. And if you're working with, it's much harder to pull really good drawings out of you if you're working with mediocre drawing, writing. Yeah, you have to make it up. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming.